what a disaster, Hoarders, home was. And now it's been saved, and turned into a beautiful B&B. The house ultimately gained fame for its appearance on Hoarders, when the new owners of the house Eric and Michael tried to help its previous owner clear out the house. This bed and breakfast takes the satisfaction of a clean room to a different level. This 11,000-square-foot mansion was purchased by esteemed Greensboro, North Carolina, interior designer Sandra Coward in 1975. But in a reality show-ready turn, she tragically lapsed into collecting hordes of objects that engulfed the house before it went into foreclosure. The 11-bedroom, 9-bathroom home was originally built in 1929 for Julian Price, a wealthy and unusual insurance executive who always wore his hat in the office. Even with the help of the hoarder's cleaning crew, the renovation was a huge project, but the Fuca Rizzos say they never regretted their decision to buy it. It was curiosity at the time that inspired them to buy the house. We were renovating other houses in the neighborhood and would drive by, and we could only see the roof line from the street," said Michael. They have renovated one or two houses a year since 2013, he said. Didn't even realize how beautiful the house could be. I mean, these designers have done an incredible job. Did you even see, like, just down even, like, with Robin in this cabinet? I mean, this is the original built-in cabinet that is completely tricked out. I mean, everybody just took such time and care in the house. It's incredible. The base of the home's winding staircase is pictured in this photo of the restored mansion, Julian Price, November 25, 1867 to October 25, 1946, was an insurance executive who made his fortune in the first part of the 20th century by developing what became the largest corporation in North Carolina at the time, the Jefferson Standard Life Insurance Company. In 1929 Price hired the New York architect Charles C. Hartman to build Hillside in the Fisher Park neighborhood. The Fisher Park mansion would become Price's private residence. The 4,200 acres of the Julian Price Memorial Park, acquired by Price in the 1930s and 40s for his own recreational use, is directly adjacent to the 3,500 acres of Moses H. Cone Memorial Park obtained by Moses H. Cone. Together, they are now the largest developed recreational areas for public use on the Blue Ridge Parkway. The dark wood paneled dining room seats 12 with teal suede chairs and large windows, the library matches with teal walls and black and gold trim. All the books in the house have been there since the 1930s and many were signed by members of the Price family. One thing I didn't realize initially is that this room, had a pool table, was transformed into the new kitchen. It looks like the original cabinets were restored, I can't even imagine the work that was involved to pull that off. Michael said you have years and years and years where no one walked on the floors, and no one flushed the toilets and no one used the plumbing, and it preserved. It was like a time capsule. A gigantic time capsule spanning four floors and dozens of rooms. It looks like a two-story from the outside. So you just start trying to get your head around how big this house is, said Michael. A lot of people still kept asking, can I come there? Do you still have tours? Can I sleep there? Can I get married there? Can I have an event there? All these different questions kept coming so and we were just processing what to do at the house, he explained. And tried to make it appealing to a broader spectrum of people. So I don't think we've been very successful at that. Fisher Park Neighbors says, they have mixed feelings about the house, they're worried large groups will generate too much noise and traffic. But, the neighborhood's hillside committee is backing the Fuca Rizzos on their request for the specialty permit, as long as everyone benefits. A room made for sleepovers was the guiding principle for the playroom. A painted mural incorporates puzzles and mazes, which the girls can trace with their fingers or disappearing ink. A trundle bed pulls out for overnight company and acrobatics with friends. Evoking a bit of glamping, 
the ceiling is painted with clouds and tented with ribbons. The lights operate independently, at bedtime the girls can dream under their own starry sky. In a sophisticated twist on a guest room, the traveler's room features a global selection of furniture and decorations to welcome the road-weary visitor. I envisioned a wallpapered room, and I knew the ceiling had to be something spectacular, I wanted the space to persuade you to relax and unwind as if you were staying in a European boutique hotel. It was important that the room feel worldly, so I chose a mix of antique treasures, such as the French daybed, painted chest, and artwork, to tell a story. The team sought to create a space for family to spend time together, play games, and entertain friends. Additionally, the room demonstrates the appeal of mixing antique and modern pieces by using a combination of vintage and antique furnishings. We chose mid-century modern chaise lounges, newly upholstered in a classic chevron woven fabric, as well as a mid-century table and chairs painted in a soothing green color, says Kenny. We had fun envisioning this family enjoying their days on the beautiful veranda surrounded by nature. So what happened to Sandra Cowart, the interior designer and former owner of the home? Back in 2015 was caught in a legal tussle with Bank of America after they scheduled a foreclosure sale of the architectural and historic landmark for January 11th. Representing herself in the lengthy court battle, interior designer Sandra Coward in a petition filed in U.S. Middle District Court, said that she was deeply in debt and working 18 hours a day to save my home and get back to work. Acting as her own lawyer, Cowart filed complaints against the bank in federal court, asking to proceed in a pauperous status for those who cannot afford the filing fee and other costs of court action. The bank had won several rulings against her claims of fraud in both federal and state courts, arguing successfully to the NC Court of Appeals that Cowart borrowed $1.9 million on the Fisher Park property 10 years ago in a loan that was now approximately 67 months past due with a total outstanding debt of more than $2.5 million. Getting Sandra out of the mansion was a real battle. Even after the Fuca Rizzos purchased the Coward House, she declined to leave. They actually let her stay for six months as she organized her stuff to move. Sandra herself said that by October 4, 2016, she would be out of the mansion. The owners reached out to her, she asked for her things to be transported to a particular location. Her request was denied with the crew claiming that they were not movers. Finally, Sandra decided to live with her friends around the Greensboro area, after a painful eviction. Before the bank sold the Coward House, Sandra commented that she was blessed to have stayed in the mansion for 40 years. If the house had been sold 35 years ago, it would have confounded me. I have not had anything in the house changed, for decades, it has been such a privilege.